For those of you that don't know me, I'm Clary Wallace. I'm the director of Turner Contemporary, and I'm really delighted this afternoon to introduce Anna Cutler in conversation with Steve Moffat as we celebrate the launch of Anna's really powerful new book, Held by a Thread. I had the opportunity to read an early draft last summer, and it's a text I've referred to often in the past year as a source of inspiration for our work in the gallery. The book explores the transformational impact of art and education, enriched by Anna's personal experiences and professional insights as an educator. Drawing from poignant stories about her father, a primary school teacher who deeply valued art, Anna eloquently argues for the essential role of creative learning in nurturing intellectual, emotional and social growth. This important book challenges the conventional hierarchy that sidelines art within education systems. Instead, it passionately advocates for giving art a more significant place to cultivate agile, thoughtful, and innovative minds. Through stories of her father's dedication to teaching art and its profound impact on her own educational philosophy, Anna's book underscores that art education is not merely a tool for expression, but it's a vital component for enriching everyone's lives and for enhancing holistic learning practices. It's a wonderful read, which serves as an impassioned call to action for expanding the presence of art in schools globally. It's such a huge pleasure to have Anna here in conversation with Steve, and I know that you've known each other for 20 odd years? Mm -hmm. mm. Odd. Both <laughs> of <laughs> um, So there's lots of questions we can ask them. Um, both have championed oh, no. the importance of arts education. Anna's a hugely influential and inspiring figure locally, nationally and internationally, renowned for her tireless advocacy of creative learning. She was the inaugural director of learning and research at Tate, and when I was a Tate curator, I was lucky enough to work with her and Steve, um, who's CEO of A New Direction, which is also was an award-winning, not-for-profit organisation generating opportunities for children and young people to develop their creativity. And we all worked together um, on Steve McQueen's epic portrait of Year 3. Um, where we were working with year three pupils. Before we begin, I know that staff across Turner Contemporary, Open School East and Arts Education Exchange would want me to thank Anna for her remarkable contribution to our three Margate-based organisations. Anna's encouraged us to adopt a collaborative, joined-up approach to arts education with the ambitious vision of establishing Margate as a centre of excellence in this vital field. And it's happening. <laughs> um, so we deeply value your influential guidance and inspiration. I'm now going to pass over to you two, and I think you're going to talk for... Actually, I'm not quite sure how long you're going to talk to me. 45, Great. 50 minutes. Is that all right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we definitely need people to have time to eat some of the delicious yeah. food. At, at and the a little end. bit of book signing as well, book I'm book hoping. Signing. So we won't, Brilliant. we won't... Okay. Well, thank you so much, and it's great to have you all here today. Thank you, Clary. Thanks, Clary. Okay, so um, my name's Steve, Mr. Moffat, um, and this is Miss Cutler. Um, I'm going to, <laughs> as you can tell, I know I've never done this before. So uh, don't fall off the stage. I'll try not to fall off the stage. Um, firstly, congratulations on the book, Thank um, you. which is great. We are going to have a conversation. I propose some questions here, which I'm going to stick to because I want to get them through them. Okay. okay. And Anna's going to, in the middle of this conversation, uh, read us a, a section of the book. Then we're going to have a few more questions, and then we're going to open it up to the floor. And then we're going to have some wine, and then we're going to have some food, and then we're all going to go home and watch the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> 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 so... Um, Anna and I have known each other for 22 years this year. And the first time I met you was at the launch of Creative Partnerships at the DCMS building in Trafalgar oh, Square. Yeah. Mm. And it was the night that they were deciding on the Diana Fountain. Do you remember this? Yeah. And it took forever. And we were all there drinking rather a lot of wine, I remember. And um, we were going to get, so we, we met, what's her name? Um, Tessa Jowell and the other one. I can't remember her name. <laughs> I can't remember her name now. And then we were whisked off to 
a mystery location, which was basically a hotel at Heathrow Airport, where we were going to be for three days. And I happened to sit next to you on the coach. And I went, hello, I'm Steve. And you went, hello, I'm Anna. I went, where have you got? And you went, Kent. And you went, where have I got? Where, where, where I said East London. And that was the moment. That yeah. was basically, we hung out in Heathrow from that moment. Um, <laughs> so, I'm sure many people in the room know you really well. But there are some people who might not. Could you take us through, uh, before we talk about the book, a little canter through your career? Okay, um, so to keep it contained, so we're not here till midnight, um, my career has really had two sides to it, one of which is theory and one of which is practice, and I've always been interested in both. So um, I really started to get into kind of um, theory and ideas when I was... Uh, in my third year of being a student, I suddenly realised that that actually s spoke to me. And, um, so I uh, got a place to do an MA, but I couldn't afford to do an MA, so I went to get a job so I could save money in London to do an MA. <laughs> anyway, that didn't happen. Uh, so we then... Uh, but then what happened was I did... I, 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 I was an artist educator for many years, so I was in the room. I had a real passion for working with young people. I particularly liked the resistant ones, thought they had something to resist. And um, then, I did, uh, then I did get into uh, academia and I did, was a lecturer for many years, but I still worked with young people as I did that. And I worked for several other bits and pieces, including the Beckett Archives, and then I got a job at, at the Place Theatre where I worked with John Ashford and did a lot of dance, worked with Dance Umbrella, lots of these things. But then I got uh, my first sort of a uh, kind of key job, the first non-freelance job I mm -hmm. got was at, uh, in Belfast, where I ran Young Art, I set up an international children's festival. Uh, and I did that for several years, and like menacing. And then I came back, I came here to do, to Margate, to do creative partnerships. And then uh, I went to work in uh, Tate. And through all of this time, I've kind of done a, I've always felt that in practice there wasn't enough research, and then if I went to research, I'd go, oh, where's the practice? Uh, so in the end, I kind of brought those two things together, and that's kind of where I am here. Good. Now. Marvellous. Thank you. Thank you for a potted history. And <laughs> I didn't know about the Beckett Archive. Oh, did you not? No. Oh. I really didn't. Oh. That's really interesting. <laughs> um, so, can you tell us about the title of the book, uh, Why Held by a Thread? I think I know why, but I want to hear it from you. So it, you know, it has two meanings. So at the mo you know, there there has been an ongoing collapse, I feel, of arts in education in schools, um, not just generally, but in schools particularly. Even when I was in creative partnerships here, there things had got harder to do, um, and uh, I, I, I'm actually doing a bit of research with some head teachers at the moment in London. <coughs> And I've just never known it as bad. I just have never, I don't even recognise it. It's so terrible. And I said, oh, you know, when, where do you see creativity in schools? And a secondary head, who runs a really creative school, said, you don't see it after year six. And I just, my heart just dropped to my feet. It's like, my God, 14 years of school. And most of that won't have anything <laughs> that you enjoy in if you uh, aren't STEM-based. So anyway... So that um, so so I think it really is held by a thread right now. There's less and less teachers, less and less going on. The performing arts are really struggling. Um, so it's it is held by a thread, and of course it's got impact in higher education, where you know we're seeing less people going to university because they haven't done it before, and we're seeing courses close. And you know, we, we we know this, right? We all know this. But that is it. That's what's happening. And Ensa did a uh, a report on it years ago saying there's a there's a break in the pipeline here yeah. it's inevitably going to end up this way and here we are what a surprise um, so I wanted to, to I wanted to say you know I wanted to say how dangerous it is we are held by a thread it really does matter and we keep on not entirely doing anything about it and I really feel like we should and then the other thing I feel is it does is the thing that kind of holds us mm. it's a real it's a thread that makes <coughs> humans bond and um, 
you know, I remember when I was actually working here and we had a group of head teachers. I mean, one head teacher saying, we always do art. And someone said, why? Why do you do art? And she said, well, it's, it's just sort of wrong here. He said, well, it's just the glue. It's the thing that keeps this school together. It's the glue. And I remember thinking, mm, you know, and that, that glue is being eroded. Good. Um, I agree. Was that adequate? No, I think, I think that was pretty <laughs> adequate. Um, I, I want to delve into a little bit further around the intention and purpose of the book. Mm -hmm. So actually, the landscape has shifted over the last 25 years. It has never been as bad, and I've got some statistics that I'll share at the end to describe how bad it is. But your intent, what is your intent with this book at this particular moment? So I, I wanted to open up the conversation because, you know, a lot of what I've written in the past has been for an academic audience, you know, <laughs> 12, no, um, or a bit more than that. Uh, but, it, and it's, uh, and they are gatekeepers uh, in academia. And I, you know, I love academia, and I've, uh, but it's a gatekeeper for ideas. And so when people don't really want your idea to go out and they kind of hold it here, um, or, you know, people make choices about what will or won't be said. And I wanted to open it up. So I wanted to, to write something that anybody could pick up and read and go, oh, no, I get this. So I wanted to avoid jargon. I wanted to, uh, I just, you know, art is made by human beings. I think uh, human beings can understand it. And there are often things I read where I go, ooh. Um, and so I wanted to pull together all, the, all those sort of, those threads of my life and uh, what I think about arts and education, so that everybody could read it and enjoy reading it. <coughs> so, but it was really about being able to open it up, which I hope I've done a bit. Yeah, yeah, I think you have. I think you have. I don't know how many people in the room have read the book, but it's incredibly accessible. It's also very funny. It's quite cheeky in places. Um, these are basic questions, but when did you write it and how long did it take? I know that sounds really naff, but I don't <laughs> understand <laughs> how you write a book. So I, um, so I, I, I got asked, actually, if I'd write a book by... The, we had a new publishing director at Tate when I was, when I was still there, so I left two years ago, uh, or three years ago. God, how time flies. Um, and they, uh, they asked me whether I wanted to write, but he felt that there was a, something missing in a kind of more general book about it. And, and I started whilst I was there. And so this book is only 20,000 words deliberately. Uh, so that, well, I had a go at it. So I started to write mm, pandemic, furlough, furlough, the other word was okay. furlough. Uh, and so I started writing it and I wrote <laughs> and I pulled things And it was 15,000 words. The first chapter was 15,000 <laughs> words. And I, I, I read it and I thought, I don't fancy reading that, and I wrote <laughs> the bloody thing. So, so I did. So I then I did that thing that I tend to do. I was like, right, I'm going to put myself in a tiny box then. Uh, so I thought, right, only twenty thousand <coughs> words. Right. You know, keep it pithy. Get rid of all the stuff that no one cares about. And I used to read through and go, no, no one cares, Anna. No, no one cares. Um, so, uh, and and I, I I sent it to somebody to have a look through, and, and she kept on saying, well, I love the stories in it, I love the stories, and I, and I was like, this has to be a story, come on, Anna. You know, so so this has to be a story, or it has to be part of stories. And yeah. then the single story that I had used quite a bit in talks that I'd done was about the, the thread. Yeah. That is a story, my dad's story, which I won't give too much away of, but there's a story about thread that my dad tells, and... He was a, a primary school teacher, and um, he uh, and and we uh, again not to give it to him, we got it slightly wrong in the family as families tend to. Uh, and then when I went to ask Dad if I could use that story, so Dad's um, ninety three now. Oh no, ninety three, nearly ninety three. Uh, you know he's really frail, and I wanted to make sure that um, you know I could I could you know offer something to him you know, by way of doing something now that he was really about, which was, you know, to, to, to get the idea of some sort of equality is into the world. So, so that was, that, that's the why. Yep. That's the why. The how uh, is, um, I'm a very disciplined person. Well, are you? <laughs> really? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, so, um, I did get up and, uh, 
you know, I knew what I needed to do. I knew how much I wanted to write. I knew I could only use one story for each section. I knew, yeah. So I gave myself a framework that was really tight, and I wrote for four hours every day until right. I'd done it. It got easier as I went along because I began to know what I, where I was in the zone, you know. <coughs> Some things went a bit skew up and I had to rewrite it. Morning writer, okay. you know, I, I'm not, not so good in, in the afternoon or the evening, so morning writer, and it took me about three, three or four months to actually write the body of it, okay. and then refinement and a load of old stuff around the edges that needs doing. You talk about your dad, you just talked about your dad, it's, the book is dedicated to your father. He is a key voice throughout the whole piece and he's a constant presence. You can feel him sort of observing you as you're writing almost. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your dad and his, without revealing the narrative around yeah. what happens, but his qualities, his beliefs, how he inspired you and what you learned from him? Um, I thought these questions were just sketchy questions, and we might do some, we might not do others. No, we're doing them all. We're doing them all. <laughs> we are doing them all. This is the one I didn't think about. <laughs> um, so, well, the thing about Dad was he was great. He was a great dad and very generous, and he played a lot with us as children. Mm. And um, he used to do magic. He got the magic. He got inside the world of a child's mind. You know, he knew the magic of being a child. So he used to um, put. Caramac bars in envelopes and post them through the letterbox on a Friday for us. And that was <laughs> thrilling. Or he used to do, you know, he used to make our beds and set them up with teddy bears and dolls so that they looked like they're having a conversation or a dispute or something. So he kind of got the magic of the world of, of children. And he also got the, the sad bits of the world of children. I remember him saying to me once, you know, can you learn when you've got a sore tooth? You know, it's like, no. And he said, well, if you've got a sore heart, it's probably even harder. And that really, really resonated with me. I thought, well, there are quite a few children with sore hearts out there. So, so he, he, he connected into the world of kids and he also mucked around quite a lot. So he'd be mm. the person mucking around behind the bike sheds, I imagine. And he'd set fire to things, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> other slightly dangerous things. And then he was massively overcautious at other times. So right. we would, we, we used to go camping every year, which we were rubbish at and we all hated. Um, but we insisted on doing it. It was like the annual garroting of a child. <laughs> of <the> guy <laughs> and, uh, and he used to spend the whole time going, stay away from the sides, stay away from the sides. <laughs> um, but he, he did everything with um, a great gentleness. And I thought everybody's fathers, were like clean, you were like that and washed no. up and cleaned <laughs> and cooked and, yeah. you know... Um, you know, he was. He, he, we knew about justice and injustices in the world, particularly through Dad. You know. And has he read the book? Yeah, he did. I okay. mean, he couldn't really read it now. I don't think he's kind of. He's he's uh, he's struggling more now. Um, but yeah, he did. And he said, he said, oh, I think you. I think I said, oh, yeah, have you read it, Dad? I said, yeah, yeah. And I said, what do you think? He said, I think you make me sound better than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Modest. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about the arc and the journey of the book? Um, so on my first reading, I, I really did feel it was like a love letter to creative learning. So, and I really like that idea, but there are three key areas that Clary sort of hinted at earlier around the value of art in schools. The intellectual, the emotional and the social. So can you talk about why you landed on that structure and actually how you, um, how you chose those areas of focus? Um, so there are plenty of books about um, art itself and <laughs> art as a discipline. And I don't, I don't want to take away the value of just art, <laughs> you know. But I did also want to point out that there are, that there's an also part to art. These are the, the things you also get if you do art. And they are incredibly powerful and enriching. And we don't talk about them. We're really poor about talking about them as a culture. Um, and, you know, they're, because they're the things that people don't seem to value, except, of course, they're the things that people value the most, which are the, 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 the social and emotional and how you're thinking. So, so I wanted to just... Um, and I wanted to pull those, those aspects out because they're effectively the most, the, the categories that are 
um, most used or talked about or discussed, generally speaking, and social and emotional education is a thing and discipline in and of itself that lots of people have uh, written about. So, um, and I wanted to, I didn't know what to, word to use, and I, I say it in the book, that the word intellectual, you know, people roll their eyes whenever I use the word intellectual, but I can't think of a better word. I did try to find a better word, but I don't mean academic, and I don't mean intelligent, they mean different things. So, you know, for me, intellectual is about how you use thought, what you do with it, how you go about thinking. And that's what art does so brilliantly, and you can't not do it. And I suppose I think, you know, th these are things you can't not do if you're doing art. You will inevitably do them if you make art. Um, so, so it, it kind of gave me, a, gave me its own frame, really, that that's, that's what it was. And then, you know, I was going to talk about the physical, because there's a hugely f physical part of, of making as well. But I, I've kind of written that into the last bit slightly differently, because there's also a kind of broader conceptual physical sort of domain that I think that learning sits in. So, so that was the sort of, that was the arc, that was a frame. I had it in different order to begin with. I was going to go with the emotional first. And, right. and then I thought, no, let's get the intellectual <laughs> navigate first. Um, so, <coughs> but it sort of started to shape itself uh, over a while. It was like, <coughs> well, obviously it goes from this and then it builds into that and then the social and it began to feel like it. You know, I know it sounds funny, you asking me about writing a book, but it kind of writes itself. You know, I found myself going, oh, gosh, who thought? Yeah, oh, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, there's like what I felt as I read it for the second time. There's like a conversation that you're having with yourself continually throughout, and you use humour an awful lot, which is great. I love that because it makes it incredibly accessible, but it's also funny. Um, can you talk about your use of humour and your questioning and where that comes from? Another one of those questions I didn't actually think about. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so come, come, uh, you know. I I've always used uh, I, I enjoy humour and actually funny. My dad was very funny, uh, very physically. It wasn't word funny necessarily, but it was. He used to he used to use it for tension avoidance. I'd call it. So if there was an argument going on, I'm the youngest of five children, by the way. So I did a lot of watching. Uh, but if there was ever anything going on, uh, he used to do things like, you know, put something on his head or hide in a cupboard or, you know, th things that I use as metaphors now, like, oh, I'm going to hide under the table. He'd actually hide under the table. And so he, he kind of, he, he was very good at bringing levity at uh, those times. But he also, um, but it also put things in perspective. And I think I like to use humour at times to either highlight things, it's often very good to, as a contrast to the very serious, but I also do think it puts things in perspective. And I do find myself laughing at quite a lot of the insane things that go on, uh, rather than weeping, which probably would be the alternative. But, you know, the world is kind of mad, um, but there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of joy to be had in it. Throughout the book, there are various academic references. Yeah. And there is this sort of tension, playfulness with narrative of what you're observing and seeing, what you're thinking, but also how you're placing that in a context. And I'm going to try and read some of these academic people's names. But there's a lot. And, and I think this wrestling, this is interesting, this thing that you talked about in terms of your interest in thinking, critical thinking, but also academia, personal, and actually your work. And I want to understand that more. Like, do you, let me go back to my question. Can, can you talk about your relationship to theory okay. and academia? Um, so, uh, yes, it's very good, thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's I that. really, no, well, I really do care deeply about it. So I care, so I didn't really ask, answer your last question very well, did I, I realise no. now? Um, because you asked me where, it, where my questioning comes, comes from. from. And, um, uh, and uh, the answer to that is I'm not entirely sure, except that um, I was very, very ill as a child. Um, right. So I missed at least two years of school, possibly three. And I had enough, it was serious enough for me to consider my own mortality. And I was young, and I think that changes you a bit. Um, but not only that, um, we had, so I did, s I honestly laid in a dark room for many, many weeks. 
and you do think a lot about everything in that. How um, old were you? I was uh, 12 when it first started and then recovered a bit then I, between the ages of 14 and 15. So I missed all the really, the really essential time being at school and passing your exams. Um, which, um, you know, and I did in the end, but not brilliantly, but I did pass the exams. And I remember thinking, what's school for? I can't remember now because I wasn't there. But still, I seem to have... And it was about being white and middle class. So that's terrific, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, but what I also did was uh, read everything that we had in the house. So, and we did have books now. So I, I read, um, we had all the classics, we had Penguin Classics. My mum was doing psychotherapy, so I had a bit of psychotherapy. Then I had um, recipe books, so I have a really p peculiar range of recipe knowledge, if you want it. Um, I, poetry, a lot of poetry, right. and uh, in that, um, so, and I, I honestly, I read everything because I was off school for yonks. Uh, so I even read a book of quotations, um, but, and the encyclopedia. Reason encyclopedia. Um, you bored. <laughs> yes, I was bored. Um, but one of the things I read was oh, I can't entirely remember what its title is now. It's a it's T. S. Eliot collected essays, and one of them, or maybe it's a it's maybe it's a whole book. But anyway, it's called something like the invention of tradition and the uh, <coughs> importance of the individual, or the something like that. I can't and it basically <coughs> talks about how everything is invented and reinvented and nothing has to be the way it is. And for some reason, that just smacked me in the head. And I remember thinking quite young, oh, nothing has to be, everything's invented. Nothing has to be the way it is. So mm. why is everything the way it is? And um, what's going on here? So, and it, it, uh, I really do think that that kind of prompted me and I was in a position where I could be prompted and had time to be prompted to kind of go, is it? I, I think I'm just genuinely a bit suspicious now. I go, is it? Who says it is? What, what gives somebody else the right to decide that that is the way that we're going to do things? You know, and, and so I do, I do feel like I, I, I'm up for challenging things, even when I'm also very convinced by things, but I'm also quite suspicious of being told that something is definite. Yep. Could you read us a section of the book? I could. How are we doing for time? I don't know what time we started. <laughs> 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 what time do we have to be out? <laughs> so I thought if we did half the book... No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep it short. Should we yes. keep it short? Short and sweet, she said, hopefully. <laughs> well, you'd have thought I'd have turned down the page, wouldn't you? I, d I did turn down the page. Where's my book? That's no, that's, this is mine. That's yours. So you must have turned it down. It's all right, I found it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <coughs> Fairly near the beginning of the book, just for context. I love a question. I don't think we ask enough of them. At the age of three, my daughter asks questions relentlessly. How do you buy money? How small can a grain of sand get? Most children do this with particular cases accepted and it can get quite existential. It's really important to ask questions to figure out the world we live in. And yet much of my own education in schools and perhaps yours too, involved a lot of hands down moments. I'm still reeling from the Dyer incident of 78 in which my physics teacher, Mr. Dyer, told me off for asking why, if you could get infinitely close to something, as he'd just been explaining for quite some time, you could actually touch it. Like, this goes back to a bit before, that wet brush in my ear. How could both be true? I realise now that he might, helpfully, have given a few moments to address this, and maybe mentioned Zeno's paradoxes, in which a range of theoretical ideas and propositions are exposed to be logically unacceptable. This touch it, can't touch it problem is in fact a very well-known one, but I only found out about this many years later, since from this shaming incident, when my stupidity was called out, I have very efficiently been put off physics for the rest of my school days. <coughs> Instead, I received the general communication at the time, don't ask, don't challenge the given, accept what you're told, even when you can't make sense of it. 
To be fair to Mr Dyer, and indeed to all teachers, there might be multiple reasons for a lack of response, one of which could be that if every child were to ask a question in a group of 30 students in 50 minutes, you probably would never get to the end of a sentence as a teacher, let alone reach your lesson objectives. But it doesn't feel that we're achieving an, an optimum here, educationally speaking. From high class numbers to insufficient time to restricting questions, it all looks a bit wonky. I've met many remarkable teachers and I'm amazed at their commitments to children's education and experience. Many do invite curiosity and want the very best for every child, working mad hours to achieve this. It's the way in which the entire educational enterprise constricts opportunities for questioning and thinking in favour of transmission and testing that I find unhelpful. What genuinely puzzles me is the conviction that telling and showing rather than doing and finding out equates to learning or is the best way to learn. It so obviously doesn't and isn't in so many instances. It's like thinking that someone would be able to swim simply by watching or being instructed by the poolside rather than getting in the water. The point is that we might have information given us to about things, but this does not necessarily mean that we always learn. We seem to have a lot of questions to ask to address the many complicate, complicated issues of our time. Can we invite a way of thinking for children that encourages questions and questioning from the outset? Are there reasons why we wouldn't want to do this other than the limitations of time? Fabulous. Thank you. Not the funny bit. It's, no, it's not a funny bit. Um, there are a number of characters throughout the book, like Mr. Dyer. There's your dad, the boy with the thread, Claire the artist, the girl and the glitter and the snow children. I mean, there are a number. You have extraordinary observation skills. Um, and I've forgotten my question here. Um, which of these characters, in terms of this particular book, has had the most <coughs> profound influence on you? Um, well, <coughs> everybody in the book is real. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are those people who, for legal reasons, I had to change their names, and those whose names I didn't change, but I had to get permission from them to use what they said, which took ages. So next time, nobody's going to get mentioned. No. Uh, so, um, and I don't, I have to say, I don't think... Even, even relative to this, that everyone has, you know, gives something really important to the texture of what I wrote. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I was trying to think. I was trying to come up with one. Steve's asked me for one. <laughs> I must deliver. Um, but, but I really don't think I can because I think that, you know, it, it is. I'm a bit of a magpie. Yes. So all the things that people say, I kind of go, ooh you know, that's really important, and then take something else. So I kind of, you know, it's a collage. It's a Rubik's Cube for me. It's multi-layered, and I, you know, what you experience with the snow children, even though initially you're quite grumpy about it, yeah. and you don't quite <coughs> like it, you find the truth within it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, what I wasn't really wanting, I was trying to sort of tease out, was there a, I mean, the Dean yes. is... is without revealing too much, but there is, you talk about embarrassment. Yeah. And that's really interesting in terms of learning. And I find that completely fascinating, but you have to buy the book and read it to find out about what happens <laughs> with Dean. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is you continually revisit an example of like a story or something that happens throughout yeah. from the lens of intellectual social, emotional. Is that something that's innate in who you are? That, that wanting to analyse, understand from different perspectives? Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, t yes, it is. Uh, you know, it's... it's um, I, I mean, again, I'm not entirely sure why, other than I feel like I, I need to understand the world better, and I un need to understand the partic my, my particularity in relation to the world. So when, when we're doing something, I am, I'm always interested in what, what, what people are doing and what children are doing, but I'm also going, and what's really going on there? You know, what sits behind that this is going on? I'll kind of go, and the question before that? With, mm. you know, or the question behind that? Well, actually, 
what are we seeing happen here? And I feel like in our discipline, on the whole, we don't do a lot of that. We tend to describe things and do case studies of things. But I suppose I am interested, you know, theory is, you know, that's, it, it's about kind of accounting for the principles of something, isn't it? Or accounting for the phenomenon. And uh, that feels really important to me that we start to be able to better account for the phenomenon of what happens with, within the arts because we keep on not being able to make a case for ourselves under any situation. Or we, we keep on asking the wrong question, or we keep on trying to supply the information that just feeds the problem, yeah. or fits in with the problem. <coughs> I go, why don't we ask, it, you know, we're a bunch of you know, reasonably intelligent people, let's ask a better question. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, I've been asked for, yeah, I got, I've been asked for so many things by people um, to prove this way, is there more of this? And in the end, I was just like, no more. I keep on counting things that don't count, and I'm not going to do it anymore. And I think I realised once when I was having to write a report for someone, you know, 2018, and seven of these got this, you know, da 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 da. And um, not once did they actually ask me what anyone had learnt from it. Yeah. Not once did they ask what the qualities were of what happened. Not once did they kind of suggest that there might have been something meaningful in making meaning. And that's, that's mostly what human beings <laughs> want and try to do. And I kind of go, wow, you know, that is spectacular. <coughs> that in, in 30 years, you know, bells going, no one's actually asked me the one thing that matters. I think um, I've seen you speak on a number of occasions and I, my default mechanism when I'm talking about what I do is about the how it's about the story, it's not about the why. And I think what you've just articulated there is fundamentally the bigger question around why and, and <coughs> what are we learning from this. Um, okay, I've got all completely lost here in terms of my <laughs> questions, um, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, so we, we go through the arc of the book and we end up, and I, I found this bit really moving, the bit around year three, and I loved doing that project and it was a real privilege to do it, but the whole thing about um, the situation now. And um, so the current situation with cultural and creative learning is very challenging. According to data from the Cultural Learning Alliance, there's been an overall decline of 42% in the number of art GCSEs entries since 2010. The vacancy rate for art and design teachers has more than tripled. The number of initial teacher training recruits for art and design has fallen by 19%. Things have never been as bad as they currently are now. And, you know, music, teachers fallen by 56%. Um, so towards the end of the book, you start to talk about what can we do and what you think is the most important, what do you think is the most important thing everyone in this room can do about the current situation with creative and cultural education? Apart from read the book. <laughs> yeah, obviously. But, uh, um, well, you know, it's <coughs> understanding how difficult it is, but... Um, when I left Creative Partnerships, so I don't know whether people know, but Creative Partnerships was a <coughs> national <coughs> plan, really, um, started in 2002, and it was about getting um, arts and creativity back into schools. Now, the reasons were around, were really economic reasons, yep. which were about, you know, innovation. They wanted innovation, and if you didn't, t uh, you know, teach for innovation, how are you going to get an innovation workforce? to make you money. So much of everything in education is about, much of everything, in fact, pretty much everything is about units of value in a kind of financial sense. Um, so, um, so and, and when we finished Creative Partnerships, the first thing that, um, that happened when the government changed, they got rid of Creative Partnerships as I think one of the first four or five things that they did, even though they had reports back that had been quite successful. And yet they still removed it. And I remember not a single person wrote to complain about that. Mm. No one. And I thought, well, then we deserve it, because none of us are prepared to complain. We just go, oh, well, it's another thing that happens. 
Um, so, <laughs> I, but I think we're a bit of a culture that does that, mm. you know. And I mean, right now, you know, another wave comes over and we duck underneath it. Totally understandable. So I'm not having to go at anyone. Because, um, yeah, at the time, I didn't either. I think we all just did that, oh, my God, yeah, you know. Yeah. But... People do, it turns out, send letters to their MPs about street lamps going out or holes in the roads. And I kind of go, why is it we don't get up and go and just send notes? Because that is <coughs> the kind of, as a political structure, that is our first port of call. Mm. Now, I did do that recently. I won't tell you what happened. But uh, <laughs> uh, one, one, one person invited me to go and have a conversation. And the other person um, sent me a kind of list of tests you can guess who this is. You know, kind of an, an extra challenge where I should do this and I should do that. And I thought, wow, I didn't realise I was the MP round here. Um, so, uh, the, so it's uh, so, and we do, of course, have a culture and, and politics that make everything everybody's respons you know, your own responsibility that you want to get on with. Uh, so, you know, I think we do have to generally kind of find energy to, to be yeah. moved by this. So that's the first thing. So I'm hoping a bit that people might feel the energy to do that. But I also think it's about things within our reach. And I think that's very much what I got from Dad, which was he did things that were within his reach. And they were small things, mm. but I think they certainly made difference to children's lives mm. uh, in their moment. And after a while, those big things become yeah, aggregated, larger things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I feel I do feel like it is the things that are within <coughs> within the things that we could do, or the one thing that would make a difference. Um, do you know, do you know the t or Eric Booth often talks about trim tabs. You know, <coughs> the, the the things on aeroplanes that make them suddenly go left or right. They're tiny, tiny movement. And the idea was so brilliant, they put them onto oil tankers. So instead of having to kind of turn round, you know, <laughs> by going uh, around the world, they could turn in their own circle. And they did that by these trim tabs. And, and, and I, th I think that's a really useful way to it. It's like, what is the trim tab we use here to turn the boat? You know, how, what is just a small but, but useful thing that we might do? The one thing that we could do. I mean, I wish I'd asked the school, I wish I'd gone into the school where my children were and asked for them to do, in the primary school, to, to do um, art or to do it better, yeah. uh, or <laughs> just to do it. But the school that um, my children went to, the primary school, used to have cones outside when you went <coughs> to pick them up. Like, do not pass <coughs> these cones. So I knew where I was meant to be and it was not in that school having a conversation with the teachers. And I, not all schools are like that. Unfortunately, that was that at the time was. But <coughs> we need to be having much better conversations, all of us together. So that is my hope, or that is my thing, which is let's just have it right. Let's start by doing what's within our reach, and one of the things within our reach is having a conversation about yeah. it. Um, and, and, and we have to get it all wrong. Mm. I think the um, <coughs> there's one little bit that I want to read, um, <coughs> if I can find it, is. Um, <laughs> You are, this is towards the end of the book, I often think that the arts are a signal of how we value the quality of life for children. They are like the canaries in the coal mine. When they die from the curriculum, you know you're in trouble. And I think we are at that moment, I, I feel, I really do feel, we are at that moment of things are in crisis for our kids in terms of the future. And actually, the thing that this is about is about starting that conversation, which is great. Okay, are we going to end there? I think so. Shall we end there? Shall yeah. we do some questions and then people can get a glass of wine? Yeah. Does anyone want to ask Anna a question? <coughs> oh, Gillian. So, oh, just to say... Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, just to say, it, I'm Gillian Barker, just to say massive thank you um, both for the book and for that illuminating conversation which has really highlighted so many things about the importance of the arts. Um, today in the press it was revealed that uh, music students in conservatoires um, 
only 5% of students come from lower socioeconomic <coughs> groups. That's 5%, which means that the next generation of musicians are going to be predominantly um, middle to upper middle class. And I'm sure we all have thoughts on that. Could you talk a little bit more about the way you feel the arts have a particular role in social justice and in inequality? Oh, yeah, I don't have to... I was <coughs> waiting for the mic. <laughs> no, I have one. Uh, um, well, you know, I, I, they, they don't have to, let's say that. The arts don't have to, but they are a fantastic uh, equalising place for everybody to start, if you want them to be. Um, so I think that, oh, and what I, you know, what I love about the idea of creativity from the understanding I have of it is that it is necessarily entirely inclusive. So that actually it, it invite and it invites critique, it invites the critical. So you have to have those com difficult conversations. You have to invite the, what, what isn't in the room into the room to have those debates. And it's, for that, is, is, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I mean, in fact, I'd say more, more that, you know, I think I say, I say in the book, you know, it, the, more, the more money you have, the, the more opportunity you have. I mean, that's true of everything. But, you know, it is, it, it, there are already so many blockers to doing art, um, you know, and if you, don't, if you <coughs> don't have the finances to do it, you don't, you don't ever get to do it. I mean, you know, I do, I went to, I remember going to a private school when I was doing creative partnerships, and I remember the, um, the bloke there saying to me, head teacher, who was lovely, saying to me, <coughs> oh, I suppose you, you know, you don't think that our children should have any of this. And they had beautiful stuff. The children were playing at playtimes in the trees and they were cooking fantastic food and they had sculptures in their gardens and they were all... And I said, no, no, I don't, I don't object <laughs> to your kids. I want every child to have this. Every child should have this. So, so uh, you know, I feel like the interventions we can make, that you can make with art, go a long way, I suppose, Gillian. I feel like... They, they are small things that can make quite a big difference in quite a, you know, with, with a relatively light touch sometimes. Um, but, you know, that's probably, you know, th th there are many tomes about this. I would say it doesn't have to, you know, it, it's a certain approach to it, isn't it? Not, not every kind of art we do necessarily invites inclusion or social justice. No, but I think there's something around the minimum entitlement that children should have at school, particularly at primary. You know, I think a minimum of four hours of art, music, drama, dance, <laughs> it's hardly rocket science, um, because actually, if you're poor, you're not gonna get it at home. You're gonna get it at school. Okay, next question. Great. I'm a little confused because I think 20 years ago we had the argument creative partnerships, let's look at the useful futures. Yep. We provided the evidence, the economic evidence. We, we, we said this is how, as a society, we can thrive and we can all thrive by having creativity in it. And it all just got smashed, even though the evidence was there. So, what happens? Is it just politics or is there? But that seems silly from people who actually want to make money because you showed how we could make money from creativity. So how do we bring that back? By yeah, We already have the evidence. It's not like we have to reinvent it. No, um, but uh, yeah, I do think it's ideological. I do think that there is a real drive to, I mean, you know, to, to limit thinking. <coughs> and it's a really brilliant way to do it is to, is to prevent it. I remember, I remember um, my dad saying once, you know, um, he was invited uh, to go into a school and he said, uh, to, he was doing some kind of peer group and he said, oh, do you teach the, you know, how many children here play the guitar? And the teacher kind of went, um, <coughs> none, none. And he said, and do you teach the guitar here? And they said, no. And he said, well, would you expect them to play it then? Uh, and, and I kind of go, that's, that, but that is the kind of, that's where we've got to, which is that, it's not, it's a, you know, 
they're not in, I don't feel like I've ever been in a conversation with a politician who has really cared about, you know, value isn't just an economic power. Yeah, I'll start again. Value shouldn't be economically understood as its first point, port of call, but that is all we do. And it's not, I suppose, I think that personally that the, this um, government, it wants a, a fast buck. So you have, to dr you have to drain resources out of everything as fast as you can to get the biggest buck you can. And, and uh, education isn't a fast buck. It's a slow, you know, meandering, often irritating, late in the day kind of thing. And, and so there's a lack of interest in investing to, to get that kind of richer value from things, I think. But I also think that they're really not interested in people thinking for themselves because that's not where they want to be. But I know not everybody thinks that. Grand. Um, I'm a retired primary head school teacher. I, I retired at 55 because I could. I know that's a bit naughty. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I lived in Margate, which made it really possible. Uh, but I used to um, run a primary school in London. So I'm fully on board with... Oh, I tried to build an art room in my school. I, built out, I did outdoor learning. We built a garden. So the children had outdoor learning every week. I went to Eton with a group of head teachers and saw what they had and just thought, wow, well, okay. Uh, I, very traditional at Eton. Mm. You know, much though everybody said, oh, it's state of the art. I said, they did build a state of the art cottage because Tony, I can't remember who he was, he was leaving then, he was the head teacher, wrote a book actually when he retired. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, the boys were fascinating and they are all called the boys. So the boys were all brought in to talk to us, which was lovely. But I loved their science lab, but it was incredibly traditional. It was all black and, and wood, you know, like really, really like something out of Oppenheimer, really, to be to put it in context. So I went back and I built a science lab for our children within the remit that we had. Um, but when it came to art and having an art room, which I failed to realise until after I left and we had to build the subsidiary one, I think the biggest challenge in primary ed in particular is fitting it all in. Mm. And the biggest problem is the results-driven culture that we live in. Yes. And I would never, you know, uh, intellectual, I'm glad you use intellect because it's key. Because the biggest, you know, disadvantage for children is that lack of curiosity and the platform to speak and to ask questions. So our biggest challenge was to ensure that all our children, because I used to turn around failing schools, so the last one was, you know, the worst, second worst performing school in London when I took it on. So it was in a very deprived area, but it was in a gentrifying area. So we were very fortunate in that as soon as we started turning it around, more and more money came our way, which did enable me to build art rooms, build science labs, an outdoor garden, all these facilities, because the parents were really, really behind it. But then as a head and as a primary school teacher, you have this terrible sandwich of pressure <laughs> of, you know, your parents who now are very, very engaged and entitled, sorry, middle class <laughs> parents, but you are. Uh, so you decide <laughs> that you're going to send your child to the state school because you're a very liberal thinker and this is the thing one should do, support, you know. But then you have very, very high standards of what you expect. And you've got all the staff and everybody trying to meet those standards at the same time as engaging our disadvantaged. But also, you're, you're under such pressure to produce these results. Nobody wants their child to leave primary school unable to read, write, or add up. You know, it is the bedrock. It is the whole reason that free education was put in place. But we also all want them to be able to express themselves in a coherent, um, intellectually challenging manner. The most resistant children, you say, are the most exciting, and they are, because they're the biggest win. And they're the ones that will go out and make a difference. Anybody who, you know, is passive when they leave education, we failed them. But I must say, just to add in from, the, from an educator's point, it is such a challenge to meet these targets, but at the same time, try, you only have six or seven hours in a primary school day. Yeah. And, every day and, and I thought, what instrument can I teach the children that allows them to read music that's totally accessible? They could all buy one if they really want to. So we chose the ukulele. I know it's not very exciting, but it is the beginner for guitar. So every child could learn yeah, to play the correct. ukulele. You know, what a modern foreign language, they must have it. Let's start it in the nursery. Why would we start it in Key Stage 2? Let's, let's have them learning Spanish in the nursery. But again, it's financing it all and finding the hours in the day and the pressure on your staff that you also want to retain. And art in particular, they sit there thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not an artist. I said, well, we need an art teacher then. 
So then you try and fit that in to make sure every class gets to see the art teacher, you know. So I just think sometimes the logistics of these little things get lost on the way. But it is, it is a challenge. We live in a challenging world. <laughs> we don't yeah. need a reminder. It's, it's, but um, I just thought I'd give my little penny worth there, sorry. No, no, thank you. And, you know, you've been a head teacher doing it and, you know, you're one of the people out there thinking about it and it is absolutely you know that's uh, that's a bit that i really talk about at the end which is you know that it's the, it's the, the therein lies the rub <coughs> for teachers who do want to do it because it's almost impossible within the system we have to achieve it <coughs> of course it is a system that we've invented if i remember rightly uh, that we didn't have to and it doesn't have to be like this and the peter gray book which is free free to learn um his son fa was failing in schools uh, in, in the school he was in a uh, very smart kid, but failing, and so he, he, they, in the end, he takes the, his kid to a school that doesn't have any exams, and, uh, and he really is terrified because, you know, the kid won't fit in, will he? He won't get a job, things won't happen, da da da. All the children in this scale, school, and I've forgotten which one, is it called? It's not Somerville, I can't remember what, the Sunder, Somerville. yeah. Um, it, you know, they do exactly the same in life as any other children, except they're much happier. Mm. Uh, and I kind of go, we've got so fixated on the way that we do this in these blocks, but actually children learn differently, you know, or can learn differently. We've just, we've just created a system that makes it very difficult for everybody. Yep. And um, fundamentally, that's a bit nuts, isn't it? You know. Um, <laughs> I've we got, well, yeah, we're going to stop. <laughs> I've got one more question, um, which is, you've obviously got another book in you. <laughs> Are you going to give us a clue? Well, I, I do have another book in me and I, I have written the first couple of pages of it. Um, so at the moment, it's called Plan E. Uh, so it, it's a, it's, and it's a bit more about my experience about <coughs> actually a, a kind of how quality what might operate in all this because we don't often talk about quality very much. Um, so I'm going to have a bash at that. So it's either called Plan E because there was a there was a there was a really I, Plan E or the Omni Shambles, because uh, the one of the first things I ever did uh, as a, an artist educator going to school was an Omni Shambles, and um, I was so ashamed of myself. Uh, so uh, yeah, so Plan A B C D had all failed, and Plan E was my improvisation. So possibly. Look forward to it. <laughs> um, I just want to say um, thank you for being so open and putting up with my questions. <laughs> and um, people go and hang around. Yes, please do, yeah. Okay. And please, delicious food for, uh, I think, Bottega. Caruso, thank you, Simona. Have you? Not just us, but other people. Other people as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. D but a little thing, and I wanted to say thank you to Sheila Lamb who has helped uh, produce today, and to Clary and your team, uh, Toby as well, if you're around. You've been so beautiful and lovely. It's been a real pleasure to do, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.